Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone, welcome to the Startup Shop Talk live show. My name is Josh David Miller, aka JDM, and I am here with my friend and co-host, Dan Cassis murray And today, we're talking entirely about what you need to know to pitch your startup to potential investors, to potential co-founders, and even to potential customers. Now, startup pitching is really, really hard. But it's actually not very complicated. So over the next hour, we're going to break it all down. Dan and I are going to talk about what to pitch. We're going to talk about how to pitch. We're going to talk about visuals and storytelling and more. But we're going to end with a little treat. We're going to talk about the absolute top five pitching mistakes that you need to avoid. So stick around to the end. And if you're watching this on the replay, check out the chapter markers down in the description so you can jump around as you see fit. But for those of you who are, are new before we get started, Startup Shop Talk is our weekly YouTube live stream show entirely about startups and innovation from idea all the way to product market fit. So hit that subscribe button and join us every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific right here on the Rightbox YouTube channel. Now, just a quick note that today's show is pre-recorded uh, and that's due to some scheduling complications that Dan and I have this week, but but uh, we're, we're ordinarily live every single Friday. And lastly, let us know down in the comments below, what is your biggest question uh, or your biggest challenge that you have when pitching. We're really curious about it. We're going to talk about some of them here today, but drop those down in the comments below. But or if there's like 10 different challenges, like write them all down. And then after you're done writing them, pick pick the biggest one and stick in there. <laughs> <laughs> or you can more include right? more than one, but uh, let's let's not write <laughs> essays down in the comments, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so let, let us know. Really, really, really curious. And we'll be monitoring the comments. We'll answer some of the questions or maybe they'll become a topic on a, on a future show. So you know what? Let's let's uh, let's get to it. Let's let's get talking about it. So yeah. um, Dan, let's start with you. So you okay. are always talking, I hear you talking to founders all the time about the importance of telling a story. Yes. Right? So tell me, so my question for you is why does storytelling make a better pitch? Why should I be telling stories? Okay. Well, let, let's put this in context. First of all, it's like, okay, I'm, let me, you know, maybe, maybe I've signed up to do a 1 million pitch or 1 million cups presentation, or I'm in front of investors or I'm practicing uh, showcasing my startup and I'm doing that with like a slide deck, right? And basically what I'm trying to do is present to somebody overall what it is that I'm working on. And it might have like different purposes for that, right? But one thing is common to all of those and that is setting context for the audience, right? And I find that like storytelling is pretty much the best tool for that. So what is a story. Well, a story is legitimately like a story about a person doing a thing that has a problem, that kind of stuff. And, you know, it sounds kind of like, you know, maybe it sounds a little elementary. Maybe it sounds a little like, mm, you know, not professional or whatever to tell. But what I like to remember is a story is all about presenting a use case. Um, I'm setting context. I'm putting it like in reference for uh, for my listeners, right? Because everybody's thinking about a million different things. And the power of a good story is that it is like a laser focus into what you're actually talking about because you can set that context quickly. Dump a, you know, I like to think about stories as like zip files of information, right? Like you could pack a lot in there so that you can unpack it later. And that's that's why I feel like at least, you know, what I want to do with, with founders is say, Hey, look, storytelling, like practice that also. I missed all the numbers, all the, all the business models and all that kind of stuff. Like story is huge for me anyways. So you said, you said use case. I just want to clarify this real quick. So yeah. uh, and when you're talking about a story, that's a use case, you're talking about like uh, somehow a customer interacting in some way. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. So use case, at least in terms of how I use that, that particular fra phrase is a use case is, hey, I have, a, there's a problem. I have a solution. Now let me talk about the person that has that problem and the person that needs to implement that solution. So for me, that would be a use case. So for example, use case for orange sticky notes would be the, uh, the crazy person like needing to, to, to put all the, put all the thoughts in order on a whiteboard as Dan usually does. A uh, use case for headphones would be a person needing to chill out while studying or while working on a slide deck um, and like getting 
getting some sort of like auditory like zen while while we're working that kind of thing right right okay so if you're if you're in your startup pitch and you're telling this this story about about bob who's using these headphones right in this particular <laughs> way because he has this need or 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 susie who's you know doing the, the sticky notes and the dry thing we're, we're you're talking about making something up right like isn't that a lie I, it yes and no like stories stories are never really they they they're they're sort of a representation of reality right so any story that has actually occurred, I bet you that it has always been embellished and it's always had a little bit of like hyperbole added to it, right? And, and really the reason why we tell stories as humans is because we need to get information across, but also we're delivering emotions. And sometimes we need to sharpen that for our listeners. And so while the story is, I'm telling you a story about a thing, right? While that's not necessarily exactly what happens, two considerations. One is, well, how do you know that it, like the way that I experienced this thing isn't the way that somebody else would be experiencing it, right? And then the second thing is that the story is really a summary of the archetypical customer's experiences, right? So you could have person, you could have Bob over here and Susie over here. They're both experiencing like different aspects of the problem. But for brevity's sake, what we want to do is summarize that in like a couple of slides to show folks, hey, look, that you know, this is the these are the these this is how the problem presents. And it's not necessarily specific to this case or this case, but in general, it usually happens all the time. Right. So you're not you're not trying to put the story in there to say that, you know, Susie and Bob actually feel this way. You're putting this in there because this is illustrative of the the of how customers interact with your with your product. You're saying this, I want you to take away what this story is conveying, not that this story is true. Yes. Uh, the story in this case is just a device that helps us paint a quick picture for busy people that need to focus really quickly. Got it. OK, cool. Yeah. So um, so you. If that's if what is that then? Like what what do we put into a, when you say story? Like what goes into that? Okay, so there's like the grand stories, like you know maybe like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, you know The Expanse. If you're into that kind of stuff, like other people are, um, and so right, how can you not, man? Space. Anyways, so um, so like those are huge stories, right? And they're they're literally expansive and they talk about different storylines, different people and, you know, different heroes and all that other kind of stuff. Right. But that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spe spectrum is a story about a man in a blazer with a red pepper. That's it. Right. Like stories can be very simple. And there are. <laughs> I knew you'd find a way to work in your wormhole serrano pepper in there i'm really i'm really glad you found a way <laughs> thanks yeah 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 it's it's important so um <laughs> so, so a story can be actually like like very simple right and and no matter how you look at it stories are always they they always go in like a specific format right? They always have a beginning, they always have a middle, and they always have an end, right? So, okay, Dan Brainiac, right? Like, wh what are those pieces, though? Well, the beginning is all about setting context, right? It's saying, hey, I'm in an office with a couple of whiteboards, right? Some detail, not too much, a little bit of sensory information, like, and it smells funny in here. Well, I hope it doesn't smell funny, because this is where I work, right? Um, but anyways, you get the idea. Maybe it smells of like pot roast that, you know, somebody's cooking. I, I like that one better. Okay. So that's the context. Now what, and, and usually in the context, we have to say something that's actually wrong. Like there's a problem with all of this. The problem is it smells like pot roast at 2 AM. Why? That's weird. Uh, I need to figure out why. So the next piece, the middle, so that's all the beginning, right? So the next piece, the middle is what actually happens. So what happens is maybe I get up and I see that the crock pot is left on. And oh, by the way, it's not just like a, a pot roast cooking, but it was filled up too, too much. So during the night, this pot roast has started boiling and it's boiled over and there's stuff all over the kitchen and the counter, right? So the initial thing is setting context, then going into the middle is, hey, this is the action that's actually taking place. What we could say is this is the person 
It is the problem that they encounter, how they start going about solving it, but how it actually gets a little worse. And then that third part is actually saying, okay, well, this is how it's going to end, right? So I go over there and I clean up the thing and I realize, hey, this wasn't too bad for like, you know, an all-nighter. Like it gave me something to do. I had a break and all that kind of stuff. So in a pitch deck story, this could be the solution. This could be the, um, right. hey, this is the resolution to the actual problem. Right. Um, and, you know, in other stories that I like to tell, it's it's usually this is like the end is where you put the moral of the story, like the main takeaway, the bottom line, that part that like if if people forget everything else, this is what they can. This is what they can take to take take with them. So those are like the three classic parts of like any story and it's super powerful. Right, right, right. Okay. So we so we we got like stories convey information. They have a, a particular structure to them, right? Here here's why. So let's talk about how. So our, our, when we talk yeah. about the story, the story of, of Bob and his headphones or, or Sally and her sticky notes or, or or you and your pot roast in the middle of the night, like are we are we just saying like let's make this story and like I just tell it at the beginning of my pitch or, or like how do you how do you weave a story in to a uh, that's that's great. So yes, I you know. Cause, cause maybe you're sold on this whole story idea and you're like, yeah, that's dope. Like, and you sit down and like put the story together and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, wait a minute, where does this actually go? Right. Cause that's, that's kind of a hassle right. to think about that. And I think it's actually like sort of an obstacle if you don't know ahead of time, like where to tether it to. Right. So first and foremost, a story always goes in the beginning, right? Because you're like, Hey, I'm Dan with like lean innovator. Uh, let me tell you about my friend, Mike. Mike is an entrepreneur that used to work at HP and this and that, right? So what I'm doing is I'm actually, I'm setting, setting the stage, setting the context. And so in the beginning of the pitch deck, I usually like to take a couple of minutes and introduce the use case, the problem, the solution, and then, you know, wrap it up with like my actual product statement, right? That thing that says, okay, well, hey, look, we know this problem exists. This is what our solution is for it. This is how we're going to fix it. And that is actually like a really nice segue into telling people what this presentation is actually going to be about. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't just leave it there, right? Because it'll just be like dangling off and, and storyland and people will be like, cool story, bro. But what's the <laughs> point, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so how can I use this? Well, I like to use it in transitions a lot. So let's let's say, for example, I'm talking about Mike. He's an entrepreneur. He works at this tech company. And the problem is that he wants to start a he wants to like start a business, but he doesn't know where to start. Right. And then the solution is, oh, well, the lean innovator is a great place for you to start, Mike, because this is what we actually do. We help hone. We help people home in on what exactly your customers want. And OK, so that's the story. Right. And then I've dropped my my product statement telling about the lean innovator. And then I'll probably go in a little bit more solution and say, okay, yeah, so we're a cohort on online cohort based course. You know, we take these many weeks to go through these topic areas. And by the end, this is this is what we have together and all that other kind of stuff, right? So right. once I'm done telling about the business case, I've got to transition to the other slides, right? So I, I need to transition like I like to transition into like the market size after this sometimes. Sometimes I'd be like, okay, so I know this problem like is acutely felt by Mike, but I can't run a business with just Mike, right? Like I need some other folks. So how many mics are there? Well, let me tell you about the total addressable market here. And then you could just like seamlessly go right into the thing. Um, a lot of times you'll wanna address unit economics, right? Like, so this is the cost of the thing and on a grand scale, if we look at that TAM, SAM, or SOM number, reasonably the SOM number, the serviceable obtainable market, right? Or at least, uh, you know, what we can initially get at. Um, I want to see, okay, well, what can Mike afford? And so I'll tie it back as a point of reference. And so where I like to use the stories is, is in my transitions in each of the slides, you know? Yeah. So the important idea is that what that story does is it creates a baseline to which you can refer over and over and over again to right. recenter your listener. But of course, there's more than just story, right? I mean, there is a lot of other stuff that goes into a pitch. Um, and so I'm curious about your perspective on this, JDM. Like, I mean, we know what generally goes into a pitch. 
but what do you like to put into a pitch? Yeah. So I, that's, that's a great question. And it's a big question that I'll try to answer in kind of a, a specific, uh, like a <laughs> vaguely specific kind of way. So <laughs> vaguely specific is going to be my theme today. Sweet. So, um, so I mean, since we're talking about stories, right, this idea of telling a story, right, is what I would put into the pitch. It's the story of your startup. Right. It's the, that's what we're trying to do is the story of our, of our startup. And to talk here. about, yeah, getting a little bit, getting a little bit meta here. So, awesome. um, uh, yeah. So the basic idea, right. Is that your startup is a journey, part of which is already unfolded and part of which hasn't yet. And you want to tell the whole story, right. Using what you have already done as evidence for why the story is going to end the way you say it's going to but it's still a story. And there's this concept, um, there's a, a, a phrase that connotes a concept that I got from Alex Blumberg, who is the founder of Gimlet Media, uh, a big podcast company. Um, and, and, and Alex said, uh, he described startups as having a credible theory of hugeness. And there's like a lot that you could unpack there, but it. it's three <laughs> words that are best taken in reverse order, right? So a credible theory of hugeness. So hugeness is like where it's a startup. We're after a big scalable effort, right? This isn't a Subway franchise, right? This is the Subway enterprise that has franchises, right? Or this is a SaaS product that can blow up and go IPO or be a unicorn, right? We're talking about companies that can scale way be like it can scale exponentially using some kind of, uh, you know, IP and process, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the hugeness thing. And when we're talking about a startup, a startup has to have a theory of that hugeness. They have to have a, a reason that that can work, right? The, they have to have a theory for how they get from where they are, which is very much not huge and huge and is probably, you know, ramen and garages and mom's basement and all kinds of other things, right? But to go from Don't there to the hoodies. Huge, we gotta have the hoodie. And the hood, yeah, you gotta you gotta have the hoodie. We we <laughs> dropped the ball in not wearing our hoodies today, but I assure you, listeners. Dan and I've got hoodies, but um, so anyway, um, you you have to have a theory of how you're going to get to that hugeness from where you are now, mm -hmm. and right, and so that's like okay, you know, we have uh, this is how the the customers that we're going to go after first, and this is how we're going to get to market, and right, so you have to have this theory about how you're gonna how you're gonna get there, and okay. why you're the team to do it, and all that. But that theory of hugeness has to be credible. What that means is that you the, it has to be a theory that has some evidence behind it that it makes logical sense, that's rational and reasonable and has some evidence, right? It's a credible theory of hugeness. And so your startup pitch is really attempting to convey that credible theory of hugeness, right? So that's the whole point of a pitch is to convey that credible theory of hugeness. And you often do that in the form of a story, right? So something's like, so here's a, here's an entire startup pitch in like one really well, rambling I was, sentence. I was, I was gonna say, cause like, it's like, that's a lot like a credible theory of hugeness. I mean, so I was down with like the whole idea until he broke that down for me. I'm like, wait a minute, this sounds kind of tricky. It is. It is tricky. It's really tricky because startup pitching is hard. But, um, <laughs> but like, here, here's here's what like I can do this an entire startup pitch with no details in one let's long rambling sentence, right? It's not it's not hard, right? So the the story of our startup that conveys our credible theory of hugeness, right, is something like. There are all these customers out there and they have this really big problem and we have got this awesome solution for it. And if we charge X, then we can make Y dollars and we can make that work because our competitors, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we though have this really awesome team so much so that we've made all this great progress already. And here's what's next for us. And in order to get there, all we need is Y dollars and Z support from you. And we're going to crush this thing. Bam. Like that's, that's like your startup story. Yeah. I mean, okay. So it made total sense while you said that. Now there's some part of me that says that sounded really awesome off the cuff, but I also know that it's a formula. And the reason why I know is because I, I kind of, you know, not, not the same exact thing. You do this too. <laughs> I do it too, man. And right. I, you know, like I can come up with stories on the fly. And the reason why I can is because I already know what the outline is and I've practiced that out. Right. So, okay. So tell us about the outline. Like how does this actually translate into slides and what specifically should we be including to tell that theory, that credible theory of hugeness? Yeah. So, okay. 
uh, there are lots of different templates and formulas, but to your point, Dan, they, like they all follow a relatively straightforward structure. And so we, we usually have like, okay, there are 10 slides that go into start a pitch. And one of the most common formulations of that is Guy Kawasaki's 10, 20, 30 principle, which is cool. And I'll, we'll come back to part of that a little bit later. But the idea is that you cover 10 slides in 20 minutes and none of your slides have any font smaller than 30 points. And we'll talk about that when we talk about visuals in a later That's segment, but <laughs> I know 10, 20, 30, you got it, right? So, but the ten, his 10 slides are, are kind of a stereotypical 10 slides. So I'm going to go through his um, in, in kind of that order. Okay. And so your first, like your first slide, number one problem, right? That's, you got to talk about the problem. This startups exist to solve a problem to like the stories that you're talking about, Dan is like, there's a person out there who has a thing. They're smelling their pot roast at two in the morning or you know. whatever it is. There's like, there's a real thing there. They have a, they have needs, they have wants, they have fears, right? There's a thing there that we're going to solve. And there's, there's a, there's a lot of people out there that have this problem. It's a big problem. It's worth us spending our time on. Yeah. So my question about. on that is sometimes uh, I'll have like, folks that have big problems, like problems in the aggregate. And the question is, okay, well, how do I put that into a use case? Or does it, like, when is it appropriate for like the use case and the individual story and then the problem or the, the systemic problem or the societal problem that actually needs to be fixed? Like, how do we reconcile those two things? Do you have any ideas on that? So when, when you talk about the societal problem, are you talking about like a social uh, enterprise or are you talking about just... Um, the, the problems of many people versus the problems of one. Uh, that, the, the second okay. case, many yeah, people. So, so for I mean, example, think, yeah. Can I, can I say, is that, okay, so like, yeah, there's like 30 million pounds of trash that are generated every week in this small town of 50,000 inhabitants, <laughs> right? Like that problem versus Mike is an entrepreneur and he wants to use less sticky notes. How do I get right. those? <laughs> right? so, so, how, how do I get those to like communicate it? So it's actually not as complicated as it would seem, right? And I'll, I'll answer it this way. The first one is wrong and the second one is right. Okay. And I know that's a provocative statement, so I want to back it up, right? The idea here is that people buy things or yeah. companies buy things, right? So yeah. this idea of we a problem is that we have all this trash, right? That's fantastic. Like, let's create a startup that solves that problem. That's fantastic. But what we have to do is find out who our customer is. Right. Yeah. And so that's when we go through the design thinking process and like start talking to cus potential customers, right? Which could be the city. It could be the people who have the trash. It could be businesses that are producing the trash. All these people, we start talking to them. We start discovering those wants, needs, and fears. And through that process, we're going to discover that Bob, who runs a restaurant, has this problem of food waste, right? You know what I like or to do is I like to pick like that case study that's like most poignant. Right. Or right. salient, whatever 50 cent word you want to insert in there. <laughs> um, and uh, although maybe it's only a 35 cent word because I know anyways. So maybe like we take that and whenever we talk about like the total addressable market, we could say, well, this problem is actually a lot bigger than just Mike or Bob or Susie. Like it's right. actually pretty big and it's huge. Right. 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 And we're talking about like, different levels, right? So we're talking yeah, about yeah. like at the story level, we want to talk about Bob has pain, right? Because that's how that's how we're going to say that if Bob doesn't have pain, Bob's not buying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then we also want to say it's not Bob. It's it's, you know, 100 million Bobs. Yes. Right. Like and that's our important thing. And that's how we have this yeah, level. But it can also be at another level where we say that the problem of Bob is causing another problem at the society level. Now, society doesn't buy things. So we can't do with just that problem. We also have to have the problem that we're solving for Bob. I like it. Right. So you got to do like that. It. So that's a problem. So then cool. a problem is just a problem unless you have a solution. So slide number two is your solution. Like what are you like how, what are you doing to solve this trash problem, right? Mm -hmm. That made it sound like I was I was bashing it, you know, like this trash problem. Um, but like, uh, whatever your, your problem your is problems, garbage. <laughs> Bob is garbage. It's all garbage. Um, so you got to have what, whatever your solution is, right? This is literally your product. This is how not a garbage solution. No, not a garbage solution. Preferably unless a it's a garbage solution, solution for garbage. <laughs> A trash, it's, you don't want a trash <laughs> solution for garbage. Um, so you want a, um, but you got to have a solution, right? So that's like, that's slide number two. Slide number three um, is your business model. This is how you go make money. 
This mm-hmm. is who you're charging money to, how that works. Is it is it subscription? Are we skimming off the top? Like what like what how are you going about making the making money? Right. What does that look like? What does the process look like for your business model? How do, how does that work? Right. What are the patterns you're employing in there? Is this a razors and blades thing? Is this a subscription thing? Is this a transaction fee thing? Like how are we doing it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have a business model. Then we get into, all right, we have this secret sauce, right? Side so number four is our secret sauce, it's our magic, it's our technology, it's our intellectual property, it's our wormhole, Serrano pepper, it's it's all that, right? It's like, what are we, how are, how are we doing this? I, I mentioned earlier that a scalable startup is one that can has that potential to get really, really, really big. And it can get really, really big because it has some kind of IP, right? And so like yeah. even like McDonald's had had this too. Their secret sauce was their process for quickly getting burgers, right? To and fries to people quickly getting milkshakes to their customers, which it was it was revolutionary. I right? thought they the had sauce was that idea. like legit what went on a Big Mac. Mhm. <laughs> they had they had all kinds of like secret special sauces. tools and shit. Secret sauces, like they, but they did. They had like all. They had a secret sauce to get the secret sauce on the Big Mac. It was Man. all like literally. They had these these <laughs> tools that would put the precise amount of ketchup and and mayo at once on a burger. Like they had the whole thing dialed down. I think I think it was called their speedy process. Okay. But anyway, so they had all that, right? So you got to have that. Then you have your marketing and sales. Like how are you actually getting this? You know how are you getting this out there? Then we've got you know your competition. Who else is in this space? right? Who, who's doing it? Then we have the team. You know, who are you? Why do we care? Like, who mm-hmm. are you? Right? Um, and then we have, and why are you the right team to do this? And then we have your, your you know, slide number, slide number uh, eight, you know, your projections and your, and your milestones. Like, where are we right now? And where are we going? Right? What's our current status? And what's our timeline for actually achieving all of that? Right? So the financial side, and then the run, like the, the roadmap side, what, are, what features are we adding when to get to, to get to where? And lastly, and importantly, that summary and call to action. Right. Where are yeah. like what where do I need help? Right. So okay, so basically I'm telling this tidy story that we have a formula for, and I'm ending with like, okay, if this is compelling for you, if you want to do this, this is what you should do next, right? Right. Totally. So that's awesome because now I have a list of things to include in a pitch deck. But what about I know that there's probably some things I shouldn't include though. There, there are lots of things you shouldn't include, but some that, yeah. that I see that I really wish I didn't see <laughs> was uh, an exit strategy. Like a, a lot of really, I know that's kind of counterintuitive, but yeah. a lot of like um, early stage entrepreneurs will put in, oh, we're going to do an IPO. We're going to be acquired. No shit. That's how it works. Right, right? right. Like when you put that in your That is the end state. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like you are putting in there that either you are dumb or you think your investor is dumb. And I'm hoping neither of those are true. You don't want, like, we all know how a startup ends. It's going to be an IPO or it's going to be an acquisition. That's how this works. You're going for that liquidity event. Mm -hmm. Unless you're working in a startup where you have to have an extremely specific strategy for this, or it's your, or you're specifically targeting like a really early um, exit. So we're targeting an acquisition at 18 months, right? As opposed to an IPO in three years or whatever. Like if you're, if you're, if you have something really specific and sure, but outside of that, like, don't treat us like we're dumb because if your investor needed to hear that don't let them invest in your company right you don't want them involved okay so, so just for clarity though like what if i have a startup it's like a lifestyle startup and i don't necessarily am i'm not necessarily looking for investors or you know um i'm i don't have ipo in mind should i be pitching well i think that that's like, like i think that's a good good question because so much of this has been really specific to investors right but pitches do have more utility than that Right. And I often yeah. hear you talk about this, Dan. So I'm curious, like, um, let's, let's, let's talk about those rap for a minute. Who okay. else can you okay. track with a pitch? Well, I'm glad you asked Josh. Cause you know, I have a picture. So <laughs> for anybody, for anybody that, uh, that knows me, uh, and you've heard about Mike in the previous, uh, segments, this is Mike. This is my friend, Mike. Uh, Mike is, uh, one of the stalwarts in the lean innovator story and Mike's got a startup and it's called accounting business in a box actually. Um, and Mike has like, he's, he's decided he wants to build this thing, right? It's like project management software for an accounting department at, at the tech company that he used to work for. And as he starts getting, um, as he starts building things out, he knows that he needs different help from different people. So investors, yes, 
because uh, that's what we've been talking about, right? And oh, by the way, maybe if people aren't investing right away. Maybe maybe he's getting the whole come back when you get traction line, right? Okay, well in the meantime, then he's got to find some inv- some advisors. Maybe he needs like you know some coaches or counselors to help him out. Like so, it it is beneficial for him to have like a deck that he could just download into somebody's mind really quick, um, so that they can actually be in a better position to help him. Um, but there's two other two other groups of people that I feel would benefit from a pitch deck um, or a presentation or however, you know, basically like a story of your business, right? And those are co-founders and they are early adopters. So like each of them has like, they're all a part of what this company might be, right? Um, they all have a role and they all have a, they, they, they don't know a priori, like what this thing is going to look like. And so what Mike needs to do is be able to set context for those folks so that they can feel like they can enter into that. Right. Okay, cool. So um, how do you go about the process of actually changing, like creating a deck for these different audiences? Like what's literally different? Well, Okay, so it's all about value proposition, right? Um, so the investor cares about a specific number of things. The co-founder, there are things that are specifically relevant to a co-founder and then the same for an early adopter. So let's look at this um, slide real, real quick. So the general deck is what I'm calling is like the story, the use case, and the market basically, right? So investors are going to want to see like some of those things that JDM covered that, well, that you covered like earlier, right? So, you know, how's it make money? Have you gotten any traction so far? What's this product roadmap gonna look like? All that kind of thing, right? So that's for investors, which we've kind of already covered. So let's look at the co-founder thing. Now, in a conversation between um, technical co-founders and audience members at the Carlson Center, um, I think it was, uh, man, Cameron's not here right now to, to set me straight, but I think it was in 2020. Uh, so a little while ago, they had a panel of technical technical founders talking with audience members of non-technical founders, right? And this is generally what came out of the conversation. If I'm a non-technical founder or if I'm a technical founder, it doesn't matter. The people that I'm looking for um, all have the same questions, right? So here are the questions. What role am I expected to play in this startup like do you right. want me to be like the business person the biz dev person the designer the the tech person you know that kind of stuff right the second thing is tech stack okay so if you don't have a technical company or a technology company this still applies why the tech stack is really the moving parts and pieces that can that the business consists of right mm. so if it's a okay so tech right like if it's if it's a web thing right you're going to need, need, you're looking for somebody that's familiar with like the front end stuff and the back end stuff, right? The, and you could, you could drill down on platforms. But if it's a non tech thing, let's say it's logistics. The tech stack in logistics cases, okay, what are the modes of transportation? Like, like, is this on the water? Is this on the roads? Is this on all of them or whatever? Like, what particular nuances of the industry are we going to need to be like familiar with and be able to like speak that language, right? That's really what the tech stack thing is about, is the the domain really. Um, and so that third one, commitment, is hey, you know what? Sometimes I want to be a co-founder, but uh, I can only do it like one hour a week. Well, that might work. That might not work, depending on you know where we're at and and all this kind of stuff, right? And then the final one right here is the vision. It's like wait, wait okay, so are we going for that IPO? Are we going for like a lifestyle business, whatever. So co-founders need to know those particular things. And if you can have those like, you know, prepped ahead of time, then it's great. So the other one is for early adopters, right? Early adopters being defined as those people that are willing to put up with an initial or like I like to say, janky version of your value proposition before it's all polished, right? So where I got this list was on Kickstarter. Right, because it's a great platform for for early adopters. These are the common elements that they'll tell you to put into your Kickstarter video. So the project, and and you'll notice these are actually kind of similar to the investor one. Um, yeah, they are. And right, is that because your early adopters are investors? Uh, f yeah, that's what I feel like. There's like so much overlap there, 
right? Yes, yes. They're, the investors look different. They sound different. They talk different, maybe. But, <laughs> right? But they're still investors, right? Because they are basically what are investors in this in this particular case they're they're people placing bets on you and your company and your idea and your research and all that other kind of stuff right and so what you're trying to do by pitching is mitigate those risks right right yeah I, so I'm sorry I, I, can we can we pause here for a second yes I, I you just you just said something i think really worth is worth calling out you said that um they're placing bets right yeah and that's like that's like the point I think what you're saying is like the point of a pitch is to convince whoever you're list whoever's listening to you to place a bet. And if they're an investor, the bet is money, right? And and connections and network and expertise. And if they're co-founders, it's a hell of a lot of time. Right. right? Like right. it's a, and risk and, and all that stuff. Like they're placing a bet on on your success for that. And when you're talking about early adopters, they're placing a bet that this is worth their that this is worth their their time and that they should move to your platform and give this thing a try and it might not exist in three months or or whatever right like yeah yeah that's a, it's a great way to look at it like convince somebody to place the bet yeah like and as as founders we're not the dealers right we i mean yeah we're throwing down cards but but what we're doing is we're mitigating that actual risk so maybe we're the card counters <laughs> 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 well, that's great that's fantastic <laughs> don't get kicked out of the casino um okay yeah so um that's okay so so, so sorry so you got so you have these like three different decks right uh -huh. three different styles of decks for them is the is there anything else that's like really different about uh these like are we using is deck here metaphorical like we're doing a pitch and a presentation and and is it like is it metaphorical that this is just like what you include in these things or are you saying that like there's literal places where we're including some type of deliverable deck and formal like pitch thing there's like there's a conversation there like we all know like you walk into a room you set up your laptop you project the investors sit and listen like, how is that what does that look like with co-founders what does it look like with early adopters uh well okay so like not what I think about is there's the informal and then there's the formal, right? And a lot of times, you know, when I'm doing customer interviews, it's like I don't want to show up with a pad and a paper. And sometimes the act of telling them that, that hey, we're going to conduct an interview biases the whole thing from the very beginning. So sometimes right. what I like to do is not even let them know that I'm interviewing them, right? So it just depends, right? Sometimes I need a formal thing. Sometimes I don't. When... Somebody tells me that they want to tell me about their business. And I'm like, hey, you got a deck or something like that? Like, I'll be like, can you just email it to me? And I can just like flip through the slides real quick. I get it. Then we talk about it later. So that's great. The other thing right. is it could be a, as formal as a presentation um, or it could be just informal. Hey, let me tell you about this thing. Right. But in any case, like what I'm doing is I need to work on, you know, how I tell the story. Right. I need to do like, you know, presentation skills 101. Right. I mean, so that's a lot of stuff to keep track of, like with like all these different decks and all these different slides and different styles and stuff like that. So here's what I want to know is, OK, so while I'm trying to digest all of this, like what's that? What are some of the things that I can like actually just start practicing right now like even if i don't have a deck like what can i what can i start practicing well <laughs> presentation skills eh yeah that i mean like thank you for telling okay. me. thank you for like saying that that's what i meant i was like okay yeah. well how do i get good at like you know telling people yeah. about the startup <laughs> <laughs> so but there's like a lot of different ways to, to go with this and um i i, I do want to say first that like there is a whole art form that takes a lot of practice to being good at give, at presenting, right? No matter what the format is, here on YouTube or, you know, a standing in front of people to TED yeah. Talks, to pitches, like there's always like, it's a lot of, it's a, there's a lot of skill um, that goes into that. And that skill can be developed and honed, right? Though, yes, it's easier for some people by birth, but but it's a skill that can be honed, and it's something that we can that we can all do if we if we work at it. Yeah, and I was just going to ask you if, you if you felt that. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask you. I was like, do you feel like we have to like you're either a presenter or you're not a presenter? No, like, I don't buy that at all. Like there are some people actually. who. Are, 
Yeah, there are some people who are naturally charismatic, right? And that helps. It really helps. It re I'm not going to lie. Like it, it does, right? Yeah. And um, it really helps if you just have that innate ability to convey information and be quick on your feet and do mm -hmm. like all of that helps. But even those are things that you can develop and presentation skills are really things you can develop. And so you know, like, I want to talk. Growing up, I was like actually really jealous of people that did that. I was like, man, they sound so good. Like, and they have the whole audience laughing with them and crying with them and all of the other kind of stuff. And I was just like, this, how do I do this? But me, right. I, I figured it out, at least in a way that I'm comfortable with. Like, usually when I get in front of an audience now, I feel pretty, most of the time, I feel pretty good about my ability to, you know, engage people, talk with the audience instead of at them. Right. Um, right. And, you know, for me, it's all been it's been a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error, a lot of accepting that, hey, I am who I am. And there are some people that like it. Some people don't. But generally, I found that um, when uh, when I'm myself and I'm not trying to front, basically, uh, that's that's really when I get the most traction. But there are hard, some hard skills. Right. There, there are right, and so let, let's talk about let's talk about a couple of those things. And um, okay. one of them, right, is like the I think the most important one is clarity, like learning how to be clear in a presentation is the most important thing, right? This is Stories, something that I'm still learning. <laughs> well, it's something like it's hard, and it's something that we constantly learn. Like when as you when you the more expertise that you have in a subject, the harder clarity can become because it's difficult to see what their starting point is. Fact. Like what do they yeah. need to know and learn in order to enter my world? And so we think that we have to give them all of this knowledge that we really don't, right? And this is where stories are a really powerful tool for getting to clarity because you're communicating things in a natural way for people and that narrative arc right that you put into something and that yeah, applies yeah. to a pitch too and that's why i tell that like one sentence rambling story about like what goes into a pitch because it's this idea of like that's what we're trying to do is we're establishing a narrative arc and if you establish a narrative arc then we are going to walk along that journey because we get it it goes naturally mm -hmm. into the shape of stories that we're familiar with right? yeah so like sense. but clarity is really important. Next, really important thing for me is to know who your audience is. So a lot of people ignore this and they use the same pitch no matter who they're talking to. No, <laughs> your audience is really different. Like not just like investors versus co-founders, although duh, right? But also investors are different. And you're not always asking the same thing from them. Sometimes yeah. you're asking for money and you're pitching to different groups and even they are different and you should know who you're talking to. But also, um, sometimes you're, you're looking for something different. You're looking for money or you're looking for advice or you're looking for connections. You're, there's lots of things that you could be looking for that you could be pitching for or presenting for and uh, even feedback, for example. And so you, you have to know who you're looking for, know what you want to get out of it and then do that. And this is like this is an important piece of advice. When we talk about a pitch as opposed to any other kind of presentation where we're trying to convince somebody to place a bet, when we're talking about a pitch, it's always about changing behavior, whatever they were going to do before you entered the room hmm. is going to be different now that you left the room Ooh, if that, you're successful. That's weighty. Right? So it's about changing behavior. That's what you're really trying to do. So three more things, huh. uh, three more quick things. Um, okay. One is like, is practice, practice, practice. Duh, right? You're going to get better the more you go through the same piece of information. Don't try to wing it. I don't care how good you are at winging it. Don't Easy try to, to say, it. hard to do. Yes, you're, you're no doubt, right? Because you know what? I never want to practice. Like I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh man, practicing is going to like take more time. But an ancient Chinese proverb says, sharpening the ax does not t make the work take longer. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Um, dark, but true. So, right. Um, the, the next thing is like, know yourself. Don't try to present as if you're someone else because it isn't going to work and we're all going to see through it. You have to be who you are. If you're not that naturally big, charismatic personality, don't try to play one on stage. It's not going to work. There's nothing wrong with who you are. Who you are is amazing. Be yourself. Be authentic. And that's what resonates with people. We want to be 
with authentic people. So you have to be authentic. And the, the last part is basically an extension of the same thing is you have to lead with humility. Shark Tank is not real. This Thank is you. not how the world Thank works. You. Okay. Thank so you. <laughs> if you go on, if you go into a room of investors and you're cocky, right? And you're and you know everything and you give smart answers to every question they ask, you will not succeed. You will not get their money because you are not being authentic and you're not being humble. We have to know where our weaknesses are in our pitch, in ourselves, in everything. We have to understand that it's okay not to have the answer to every question and that humility is powerful and humility draws people in. It creates connections. Yeah. You know what I like to do when I think about this? Because immediately I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, no, how in the hell can that actually be right? Because everybody that I've ever seen that's like great is polished. They're good. They're like, you know, they have a little bit of edginess to them. But when I line those up against other people that I have seen that have been super authentic and vulnerable while they're actually sitting there and they know their stuff, bar none, man, it's like those presentations are always the most impactful for me as a person. Like one could be entertaining. Yeah. But the sure. other one, the other one, you said this whole thing is like the goal is to change behavior. What's a, what's a better way to, to change behavior and like presenting this flashy, cool thing or presenting a story that is like vulnerable shows authenticity that, you know, where, you know, somebody can like legit receive and make a great impact with the help that is given from the person that's actually changing their behavior. So totally. I love those points, it, JDM. It's it's so true. Like, and you know what, um, along the same lines, like, and I, I know you've seen a lot of pitches. I've seen more than a thousand pitches. I don't know how many you've seen. It's probably up there too, right? A like lot. we've seen a ton <laughs> of pitches. And um, what's amazing is when you, uh, somebody who's really new at this, their presentation is very different than somebody who's been down this road before and is pitching the third, fourth, fifth time. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. fundamentally different. And yes, it's easier for them if they have success. That's undeniably true. And like there's presentation skills differences, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a person who's just starting out thinks that they need to sell and they go in there to sell people yeah. and they try to convince you. Yeah. The person who's been there before will say openly what they don't know. They're not trying that's... to talk you into anything because they're trying to establish a partnership. And And in those cases, like I just, I'm I not gonna lie, I'm a little jealous of their confidence. Crazy, right? Because it is I know it's weird. <laughs> and it draws us in. It just pulls us right in. So mm. to put a button on that, like on that, that point, it, it's it there are lots of skills that you can develop, right? And it's about practicing over and over again. The more you pitch, the better you're gonna get at it. You just gotta keep doing it and keep going at it, keep going at it, be authentic, be yourself, and you're gonna you're gonna crush it. That's those are the skills you need, and those are all acquirable. Okay, so those are presentation skills. That's like how I do the thing, right? But what about some technical stuff? Like what should I put on my slides, right? And, and oh, by the way, this right. is an insidious question because this never this question never comes up until you're like sitting at the PowerPoint or the pages or not the, <laughs> the keynote or whatever. And and it's like, oh, fuck. Right. Well, so. well, because that's actually the biggest mistake that people make is right there buried, buried in what you said is that they figure out what they want to say. but And then when it comes time to thinking about how they want to say it, they mm -hmm. literally think of how they want to say it. Yeah. Right. And not that how they want to show it. Yeah. That resonates. Right. You yeah. have to think about how you want to show it. And so I mentioned before Guy Kawasaki's 10, 20, 30, 10 slides, 20 minutes, no font smaller than 30 points. Right. So mm -hmm. the idea behind the 30 point font is that it's not that you can never break that rule. There are cases where you can break that rule. It's not, it's not a hard and fast rule. The idea is to guide you into that. If you're using font smaller than 30, you're probably trying to put too much content on the screen. The science of listener attention is mm -hmm. that we cannot listen to you and read a slide. Most of us will read the slide and not listen to you. That's just the way that it works. Because we think, oh, the I was just gonna say, looking back at my own behavior, like I'm always struggling to tune out the presenter and read the slide whenever they're right. whenever it shows, right? Exactly. So you want to yeah. keep that content like really down super minimally because you just want to give them the one thing that anchors what you're saying. They're still listening to you, but what's on screen is anchoring what they're saying, what you're saying rather, and at the same time, 
right? You're giving them the one thing you want them to take away. So let me show you an example, right? Okay. This is cool. So this is uh, from an example pitch for, for Airbnb. And I picked that because we all understand how it works, right? So yeah. here's the market size slide. This is really simple. So you could talk about how, like what the, this is like a Tam Sam Sob slide. Right? So like yeah, you're looking yeah. at here's how many total trips are, are booked worldwide. and How many of those are actually in the budget online category, which is the one that we're trying to play in. And then like, we're here's how much we think we can actually obtain, right? This is the market share that we think Airbnb can take. So you can see it's really clear. We got three figures. It's clear that, that there are subsets of each other, right? So 10.6 million out of the 1.9 billion, right? So we can clearly see that information. There's three numbers. I can talk to the slide for 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 90 seconds and, and and with all kinds of detail but the important parts here are the ones you're going to take away here's one that's even more powerful same deck a couple slides later all right this is the business model slide and this is the one that <laughs> nice. so many people have trouble with how do you convey this look at how simple this is all right so we take a 10 percent commission on each transaction simple that's our business model one freaking sentence and then they show that 10.6 million trips. Remember, that was what they showed on the previous slide, right? 10.6 million, exact same visual. 10.6 million trips. We're, uh, and, uh, $20 we get for each trip and 200 million in revenue is what that's going to translate to, right? And so if you look down, they have the details there. That's our share of our market. That's based on an average fee of $70 per night for three nights, which if you'll notice will be $210, 10% of which would be 21. Not putting 21 here. That opens too many questions. It's 20, right? And then, and of course, if you did the math there, even at 20 10 times 10.6 isn't 200 million. It's more than that, but they rounded it to a nice even figure because it makes sense. We're grounded. We're going to remember 20 and 200. We're going to see why it makes sense. Clear easy visuals that convey the information while I talk through how we take this 10%. Clean. Right? Yeah. Super, super clean. Okay. But I like that. But okay. So we've talked through like all kinds of like really good stuff here today. Um, we've talked through, you know, how to present. We talked about the value of storytelling, like so much stuff here. But for our last segment, Dan and I thought it'd be super fun to uh to talk about like in rapid fire the five top pitching mistakes that you've really got to avoid so we're gonna go through these like 60 seconds per one we're gonna go through these top five mistakes you got to avoid so dan kick us off okay so number one is reading from your slides a big mistake there and the reason why is because it just feels off and doesn't feel authentic right so to get around this it's practice. Practice is the key. In my in my experience, what I do is I practice till I'm sick of it, and then I practice some more. Mm. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Number All right. Two. Don't read off your sides. All Ten. right. Number two, the big reveal is what I call it. All right. So this is a this is it's actually a pet peeve of mine too. But it's a big mistake. So we have this natural human tendency where we want to be like our solution is so fucking amazing that we're going to like awe people with its big reveal. We're going to yank back the curtain. So we're going to build up to it. We're going to talk about our problem here. We're going to talk about how big the problem is. And then eventually we're going to say, and introducing, and we pull back our curtain and reveal, here's our big product. The problem is we've already tuned out because you didn't give us a reason to freaking care in the first place, mm. right? The big reveal is a natural human tendency, but it does not work. What you have to do first seconds, literally of your pitch is say what you are right? That can be something as lame as we're the Uber for blank. It doesn't matter. Something really simple that gives us context so that you get licensed to tell us about the problem, right? Don't do the big reveal. Tell us right up front who the heck you are. Give us a reason to care. Dope. Okay. Number three is the, the, uh, the three, uh, sorry, the third, the third pitch mistake is too much info on a slide. So like, what what you showed us with the Airbnb one was like, look how much information is actually included on this. There is a lot of information, but it's super simple. So the question is, well, how do we actually do that? Well, I like to say pictures, words, icons, this idea of putting things on cards, super helpful for me whenever I'm, I'm putting together slide decks. So just remember, less is more. More gives you less wiggle room when you're actually telling the story. So based on who your audience is, if you have less on the slide, that's more that you get to articulate while you're actually talking to people. Right. So that's number three. All right. Number four. 
saying you don't have competition. Oh man, oh man, is this a tragic, tragic mistake because you have lost all credibility once you say it. Why? Because it's a lie. It's always a lie. You have competition. All you're demonstrating by saying that is that you don't know who they are, right? And a lot of people try to get around this like, oh, we don't have any direct competitors, right? <laughs> like that may be true, but people are spending their time and they're spending their money at a minimum in other ways. If it's a really big problem, they're also solving it in other ways. They're solving it in suboptimal ways, right? That's your opportunity, but they're still trying hard to solve it. You still have competition. Where are they spending their time? Where are they spending their money? How are they addressing this problem now? What are the weaknesses and all that? These are opportunities to say, this is a big problem. It's real. It's underserved in the market right now. And our solution is so much better. Instead of taking that opportunity to say how amazing this problem is, if you can solve it, and oh my goodness, we can solve it. You're instead admitting that you don't understand your customers well enough. So don't say you don't have competition because it's a lie. Dope. I love it. All right. So let me tell you number five. The five, uh, the, the fifth top, the top fifth pitch mistake ever is taking it too seriously. Yo, for this, for this live stream, I wore a berry colored t-shirt and like a blazer. It probably doesn't even match, right? Like, <laughs> come on. They match well, I Dan. I like it. I, I dig. Well, thank you. Thank you. I did it on purpose and I had a pepper too. So I did this on purpose. And the reason is because, look, at the end of the day, I'm just a person trying to make an impact, right? I'm not hanging my self-worth on the efficacy of my ability to convince people to change their behavior. No, what I am is I'm an observer. I'm a conveyor of problems and solutions. And I'm the provider of those solutions, right? I'm, I'm none right. of those glitzy things, right? That may seem like I am, but I'm not, right? At the end of the day, I'm a person, right? And so here's the other thing about that is as a startup founder, you're going to pitch a lot. You, you're going to do it a lot. So my, my recommendation would be the same one that I give myself is that just start practicing. And here's the key is give yourself permission to continuously improve. That is the thing that has driven me forward one step at a time. And, you know, as we all know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. It ends with a single step as well. And there are a bunch of little steps in between. You can't take a thousand mile step. No. So true. Damn. Love it. So, continuous Love it. Improvement. so so our top, top five pitching mistakes, don't read from your slides. Don't wait for the big reveal. Say who you are up front. Don't put too much information on a slide. Don't tell us that you don't have any competition because it's a lie. And don't take yourself too seriously. Now, Dan, we happen to have an extra minute here. So I think we're going to do a little bonus tip, right? Let's talk Sweet. about we are in <laughs> We are in the world of COVID still. How nice. do we pitch? Like what, what's pitching remotely look like? Let's take this fast. What's a, a big uh, a big tip for you on, on how to pitch remotely? How's it different? Well, it's basically, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of folks actually type out their notes and that's great because it sounds good, but it's still reading from slides, right? So a lot of times, <laughs> yeah, like if if I were to give one, one piece of advice that I think would be relevant is just don't read, just whether it's virtual or whether it's in person, just don't read. Yeah, that's so, so true. So true. So true. So, okay. So for me, um, I actually think complacency is the big danger because when you're presenting virtually, it can feel like it's not a real pitch. And if you treat it like that, we're going to feel that. So there's a, there is a real audience, even though they're behind a screen, right? And there, and that audience, yeah. by the way, is more easily distracted than yeah, they are true. in person. Right. So yeah. don't, it's more important to like what you're saying, Dan, like don't bore people because you're going to lose people so easily online. So these rules are even more important and don't get complacent because it's just as real. In fact, it's just a little bit harder, right. Um, to do this, to do this. Virtually. Yeah. So yeah, because you can't feel the body, you can't feel like the, the energy, the body language as much as when you're actually in person. Right. Right. Totally, totally. But the cool okay. thing about that is you can totally present anywhere, right? Yeah, you definitely Depending can. Right? Like, you want to get up. 
Yeah, well, yes, or how late you want to stay up. Uh, uh, um, okay, so that's all the time that we do have for here today on, on Startup Shop Talk. Um, but we want to know uh, what you guys are, are working on. So give us your one sentence elevator pitch. Do that right down uh, in, in the comments. Let us know what you're working on. We'd love to hear about it. You guys can join us every single Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific right here on the Rightbox YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe uh, you know, and, and give this video a like. Um, uh, really, it really helps us helps us out. And you want to be notified you know, when, you, when we get, uh, get new videos and we got all kinds of new stuff coming out. So Dan, where can people find you on the internet? They can go to LinkedIn and look for Dan Casas Murray, or you can just Google Dan Casas Murray. Like it's a unique name. <laughs> you can you can also Google Josh David Miller, or you can visit Rightbox.co to get more information uh, about uh, about me and, and what we're uh, working on, what we got up in there. And don't remember, smash that like button, give us a like, and we'll see you guys next Friday at 11 a.m. It's been it's been a pleasure, Dan. Yeah, it's been awesome. All right, cool. See you guys later. <laughs>